Order. Good morning. Uh, Lee Anderson to move the motion. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Mr Chair. And it is indeed a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Um, this, is the, um, this debate is, is not the type of debate I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to be honest, because it's, it's filled with sadness and sorrow. And I'm delighted to be joined by some of the families from Ashfield who's been affected by baby loss in the past couple of years or so. Um, every day in the UK, according to the Royal College of Midwives, there's 1,845 babies born alive, and between 302 and 428 miscarriages every single day in this country. We have eight stillbirth, stillbirths per day, and 145 babies are born prematurely, and five neonatal deaths. Now, when there's a pregnancy announced in the family, on most, on most occasions, it is a joyous, wondrous time in people's lives. They're so happy. Dads are making plans for their son uh, to be a footballer. They're, they've picked a football team already. Um, Mum's looking at princess dresses, even though the baby's about that big, as big as your thumb. Uh, grandparents are squabbling, who's going to have rights to the, to the new grandchild, who's going to be looking after. Um, and there's all sorts of plans, what schools they're going to go to. And this is especially for, for first-time mothers. It is, you know, a strange time, a, 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 a wondrous time, a joyful time. And once all that settles down, then would-be parents sometimes get a little bit apprehensive, a little bit scared, you get worried about, you know, the baby. Um, is it going to be well? Is it going to be born well? Is it going to develop, develop properly? And so it, it turns from you know, being happy to, to being concerned, but still being happy. Um, but there are quite a few risks, as we know, in pregnancy and, uh, and during birth and the, the postnatal period. <coughs> but every preventable stillbirth, neonatal death or infant, or infant death of a child is, is, is a tragedy and we must make all efforts to prevent it, it happening. And the, the, the families I brought here today, I believe and they believe, and, and the hospital believes that these deaths were preventable, mistakes have been made, things have been missed. And um, I'm hoping today that the ministerial team can, can give, give these families something to, so they can go away and know that they've been listened to. Uh, but there are other factors apart from mistakes such as diabetes, obesity, uh, drinking too much, smoking, other factors in pregnancy which can affect how a baby develops and ultimately how healthy that baby is once it's born. Uh, but yes, but like I say, in these cases there's mistakes have been made and I've spoken to some of the families, I've got two families here today, and I'm going to read out their stories, not my words, their words. I asked I asked um, them to print their words and their story so we could read it out here in Westminster Hall. And the first one is Rob and Emma Stretton. And they want to tell the story of, of um, Olivia. And this is from Rob. On the 31st of May 2023, Emma and I attended a routine scan at Kings Mill Hospital in Mansfield. During the scan, a few issues arose. The sonographer called for the assistance from her senior and a recommendation was made to contact a consultant. His decision was that Emma needed admitting immediately for observation. The time was approximately 2.30 p.m. We were taken upstairs to the maternity unit where the situation was explained to a midwife at the nurse's station. Her reply was that we should return later as no beds were available and a phone call should have been made to the ward prior to attending. The consultant suggested for us to return in a couple of hours, to which the midwife replied, this wouldn't be feasible due to the shift changeover. She said between 9.30 and 8 o'clock at night would be better. After this, we left for home and returned to the ward about quarter to eight. Emma was admitted for monitoring, and once she was settled, I returned home. Upon entering the house, I received a phone call from the midwife advising me to return as soon as possible, as no fetal heartbeat could be obtained. I went straight back to the ward to be informed that our baby 
had died. Emma was given medication to induce labor and gave birth to our stillborn daughter three days later at 18.30 p.m. The next story is, is from Bianca Chapman, and this is a Mises story. My placenta was completely covering my cervix. It was a high-risk pregnancy. I had a bleed in November and wasn't, wasn't given much advice on any risks on the early hours of the 3rd of 12, 2022. I had a big bleed and went into King's North Hospital and the registrar raised a concern but was ignored by the consultant in the space of just over 24 hours. I then had several more bleeds and it wasn't until my daughter's heartbeat baseline stopped beating I was considered to be allowed surgery. The consultant in charge had gone missing which delayed my daughter coming out. The ward was on code red. It took 45 minutes to find him. I was then operated on to find out my placenta had abrupted inside me and they struggled to get my daughter out. So they had to make a further cut in my stomach, which now due to that, I will never be able to give birth naturally. My daughter came out at 11.16 a.m., not breathing. It took seven minutes to resuscitate her. I had clumps of placenta floating around my stomach and had to be put to sleep for further surgery. We were led to believe she was fine, but we weren't able to see her. We were told they, just, they was just waiting for her to urinate. She was later transferred to LRI, which was when we were finally told the truth. She had a bleed on her brain due to being left inside me too long with no oxygen. Her nappy was filling with blood and within the space of a few hours, we were told she would be highly disabled and to get your family here to meet her as it would be in their best interests to turn her life support machine off. After turning her life support machine off, I was then told I was going to be put back on the maternity ward around all the other mothers and babies. There was no way in this world I was going to be around all these babies. Once our investigation was over, we were told a lot of things that could have prevented all of this and was told she was taken out at around 7 a.m. She would be alive right now. And those vital few hours made all the difference. Yet we were left to suffer and now have a lifetime full of pain through a choice of a fully qualified consultant. We were also told he would have known of her life expectancy would be short due to the abruption. Yet he told us she would be home with us for Christmas and not to worry. We believed in them and it later proved that it was all a lie. All that happened to the consultant responsible for our baby girl's death was that he was audited and we are both now changed forever. I was pushed out in a wheelchair holding her memory box and that's all I have of my daughter, just a memory. Amelia Bradley wants to tell Theo's story. My pregnancy was a typical normal pregnancy. I attended all the antenatal appointments and was deemed as low risk. On the 13th of September 2023, I attended Kingsmill Hospital in the evening, despite being booked a home birth to get some pain relief. On the first admission to the Sherwood birthing unit, I was left waiting for 40 minutes before being told by a supporting midwife that they were really busy and someone would see me shortly. 30 minutes later, the same midwife returned to complete my original triage assessment, something that should have been undertaken within 15 minutes of arrival at the hospital. This midwife apologized for the delays and started my assessment immediately when she came back into the room. She told me that I was between one and two centimeters dilated and that my cervix still had some changes to make until I was in active labor. She still deemed me as low risk, gave me a codeine tablet and said that I would be suitable for home birth, as the only pain relief I could get with a water birth would be gas and air. I got home around midnight and got into my birthing pool before leaving it to use the toilet at around 12.30 on the 14th of September. I had two contractions on the toilet and felt a pop, which was followed by bleeding. I put on a pad to monitor the bleeding, and within two to three minutes, it was full. Luke rang the birthing unit and put the phone on loudspeaker so I could consent to them talking to Luke and my mum because of how much pain I was in, and I couldn't speak 
to myself. They asked if I'd lost more than a teaspoon of blood, to which my mum said, yes, it's like a heavy, heavy period, but pure blood. The midwife didn't ask any questions about the pain I was in and didn't try to gather further information about the amount of blood loss. She told me to come back to the hospital. We returned to the hospital just before 1 a.m. and on getting into the ward at five past one, we was put into a triage room. Ten minutes later, a support worker came to take my observations but ignored my mum when she tried to show her the blood-filled pad and then failed to alert any of the midwives that I was bleeding. After being in the room for 37 minutes, while two triage midwives, a labour ward coordinator and several other members of staff were sat around their nursing station uh, discussing how many Haribos they'd eaten on the shift and how many midwives were on the bank shifts were getting paid more. Um, never did a, a midwife enter the room. When a midwife did enter, she took a look at the pad and her face dropped, noting the seriousness of my condition. She couldn't find Theo's heart rate, so went to get support and a Doppler to see if this could pick up the heart rate. She found him to be bradycardic, bradycardic, apologies, and issued a 222 emergency. The consultant came and ordered for a category one C-section to take place. Baby died. This is a story of Hayley Moore. My story had previous placenta eruption in 2021 and was very lucky. I was picked up. I was straight down to the theatre for an emergency C-section. But this time around, I was very anxious about it happening again and was questioning the consultant. He said I was only under him because it was a small baby last time and I wanted a planned C-section. But he kept pushing me to go natural on full term. I went in on the 17th of February with reduced movements and pains and was hooked up to the monitor and was told I can't be having contractions, so I was sent home on the 19th for a scan. I felt it was rushed, but I, I don't feel right that the baby had grown and looked fine and felt movement in the early hours the next morning by 10 a.m. on the 20th. I was at home in agony. I rang the birthing unit and they told me to go down. So I went down for an assessment and the midwife came and checked for the heartbeat and had to wait for a scan and moved down to room 11 where the bereavement midwife came up and the doctor was pushing me to go natural again as I was stable. The midwife at the time, along with my sister, was pushing for my C-section, which in the end, I did get rushed for a C-section. And again, my placenta had erupted. The aftercare I had erupted. The aftercare I received from midwife Holly was outstanding. That's, that's four stories, Mr. Dow. I recently visited Kingsmill Hospital, where I uh, um, to the maternity unit, where I, I managed to walk round with the chief nurse, Mr. Uh, Phil Bolton. It's a brilliant facility they have at Kingsmill Hospital. And the, the problem hospitals get is that the headlines in the newspapers are always bad headlines for hospitals. You never see a front page of a local paper saying hospital saves a life because that's what they do every single day. And mistakes have been made and individuals have made mistakes, but I've also got to say I'm incredibly proud of Kingsmill Hospital. It's where I was born. It's where my children were born, and it's probably, it's the, probably the place where I'll, I'll leave this um, earth when, when I eventually go. I've got no plans to do that just yet, though. Uh, but it is a brilliant hospital, but mistakes have been made. But the Kingsmore Hospital acknowledged the mistakes as well, and then they're putting measures in place, and I've, I've learned from some of the, the heartbreaking stories we've had today. But I'm not here really to talk about Kings Mill Hospital. I'm, really, I'm here to talk about my constituents uh, who have suffered the most horrendous grief. And baby loss will always happen, we know that. But these are preventable deaths. And we must do all we can in this place to ensure that our National Health Service has the support it needs to make sure we reduce um, baby loss. We know about the Ockerden report in Nottingham. Um, for me, some of the readings, some of the news coming out of that is, is, is quite shocking. I, I fear sometimes that we treat the birth of babies as like a, a production line sometimes, and it's not. It's, it's very personal. It's very emotive. Every single family is completely different. Um, mums and dads are different. 
Um, and I think that, you know, if we can learn anything from today's debate is that every single family in this country, I think, from the families I've, I've spoken to, it touches every single family baby loss does. Some, somebody along the line has been, knows somebody who's related to somebody who's had, who's had, um, who's had baby loss, whether that be a, a miscarriage or during, or, you know, during, during childbirth or, or postnatal. So I would ask the ministerial team today to please, you know, have a look at my constituents here. Um, I know it's not always possible to, to empathise because we've not all been through the same thing. But please reassure them that they've been listened to because this is the... You know, this is, I can't go any higher than this. You know, we've got the complaints in, we've got the solicitors involved. Uh, but for me, as a Member of Parliament, the only thing I can do really is listen to them, listen to their stories, and bring them to this place here and let them see, you know, the people who, who are in, running this country and, and ensure that you listen to their story and you act on, on the facts that I've given you today. Thank you, Mr. Down. I want to remind people if they do wish to speak, they should, Bob, as some of you have done. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you for that. Um, the question is that this House has considered preventable deaths. I now call upon Nigel Farage. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And Lee Anderson's raised a subject that is, I think, uh, for many people, many families, many communities, a taboo subject. Uh, something that is very, very difficult to talk about. When it comes to prevention, uh, Lee, of course, you know, you're quite right to pay tribute to the hospitals that give birth. You know, every day, thousands of, uh, every week, thousands of healthy babies are born. Where there have been errors, and we've seen it not just in Nottingham, uh, one of the Kent hospitals had a particular problem with this as well. Of course, everything should be done to make sure these deaths are prevented. But whatever we do, naturally, naturally, some of these stillbirths will still happen. I have seen the effect of stillbirth in my own family. And, yeah, it's pretty devastating. It doesn't go away. It doesn't get forgotten. Uh, but there's another element to this, which is for those people, particularly the women that go through this, are they able to talk about it? Can they share their experiences? And a, a problem shared may not be a problem solved, but it might just make life a little bit more bearable, a little bit easier. I must be honest, when my niece had that stillbirth, I didn't feel I could face her and talk about it. I felt too awkward. Would I say something that was wrong? Was it best we just didn't discuss the subject? And a decade on, even though I'm close to her, I've never discussed it. I've just felt too awkward to do it. And I suspect that's the case with many men. I suspect with husbands and partners, just something that isn't talked about. And so I, I do want to pay tribute to Councillor Jeff Bray, from, former leader of Tendering District Council, who has, you know, as a father that went through the stillbirth experience, talked about it, and I'm encouraged that in Clacton that Maria Gormley has got a charity where women, and men if they want to, can come together on a regular basis and share their experiences and talk about it. And it's not an easy thing to do, and I've admitted my own failings, but I suspect I am far from alone in finding this subject just incredibly difficult. So I think the fact we're having this conversation, I think the fact, Lee, that anything that can be done to prevent avoidable disasters must be done but I do just urge I want to put on the record that naturally these things will happen hopefully in very few numbers and there doesn't need to be the counselling and the support for people that have been through that experience which I feel to be honest in most parts of the country is really very sadly lacking. Thank you Mr Chairman. Thank you Mr Dowd. And thank you to the member for Ashfield for securing this debate. As a woman who has lost two very much wanted pregnancies, baby and preg pregnancy loss is very close to my heart. I also represent an area that in the past has seen poor maternity care cause the deaths of babies. 
I want to speak today about the importance of local support for parents and families and to give those support organisations a voice here in Parliament. I also want to highlight the absolute necessity of rigorous investigations and true candour when babies die. My constituency hosts two excellent support groups for people affected by pregnancy and baby loss. Matilda's Mission, set up by Chelsea and Matt after the death of their baby Matilda, and the Tiger Lily Trust, set up by Val in memory of her daughter Lily. Matilda's Mission and the Tiger Lily Trust work with local bereaved families. They provide a whole host of support, including remembrance boxes for bereaved parents to make and collect as memory mem many memories as they possibly can in the short time they have with their babies and to give them resources when they return home. There's sibling memory bo boxes for bereaved living siblings, sibling play sessions, support groups, which in particular can combat the loneliness and isolation that is often felt with this sort of grief. A place where people can come and heal together. There are dad drop-ins, one-to-one catch-ups, grandparent events, older sibling events, whole family events at, event at holidays such as Christmas and of course events around Mother's and Father's Day. The two groups also work with hospitals and universities on maternity bereavement care and host Baby Loss Awareness Week events. I asked Chelsea, Matt and Val what they wanted me to say today. They told me funding is an issue. For example, the bereavement suite at the Royal Lancaster Infirmary, co-designed with bereaved parents, has been closed for some time due to safety concerns. Whilst the Trust continues to work on this, maternity bereavement doesn't seem high on the agenda when it comes to budgets. As Chelsea says in her very beautifully blunt way, dead babies and their families matter too. Funding for support groups is also extremely difficult, with some groups struggling to get support for funds to continue. Support for families is currently a postcode lottery, often involving lengthy referral times for NHS services or support from charities. When families are in the depths of grief, 12 weeks to wait for a referral is tough going. Families need consistent and timely care. Matt, Chelsea and Val also wanted me to mention bereaved dads and non-birthing partners. The lack of support again is apparent and their role can often be seen as merely supportive to the mother or birthing parent, rather than as a grieving parent themselves. Something which is important to me, and I, this was mentioned by the member for Ashfield, is tackling the idea that natural childbirth is somehow superior to medically assisted childbirth. At its worst, that belief, and it is no more than a belief, has killed babies. Finally, I want to mention something which touches all aspects of health and social care and something which I'm sure our new government will take very seriously, which is when things go wrong, it is the duty of all organisations involved <coughs> to be fully truthful, transparent and willing to learn. When adverse outcomes are potentially due to failures in care, too often, families experience insufficient and prolonged investigations, which add to the trauma. We owe it to the babies lost. Baby Matilda, baby Lily, baby Theo, baby Olivia, the baby daughter lost to placental abruption, Haley's baby. We owe it to them to not only find out what happened to them, but also to make sure we prevent every single future death we possibly can through a rigorous commitment to investigations at pace, a culture of safety and the best possible patient care. Thank you, Mr Dowd. Paul, the Honourable Lady, for Morecambe and Lunsdale uh, and, and to hear her contribution as well. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for Ashfield for uh, setting the scene as he often does in, in, uh, with a passion and an understanding of his constituents uh, that, that, that all of us see and, and for uh, describing the examples of those of his constituents who have suffered uh, in this way. Uh, and he did it with a sensitivity because it is a very sensitive debate. And I want to begin by saying that uh, firstly, the grandfather, uh, father and a grandfather, of course, 
my thoughts are with those who are facing or living through baby loss because there are many who have. And I say living through because I know it's not something to get over as such. Um, just to give one example of a, of a lady who came to me, there's many, by the way, and the honourable gentleman who spoke just earlier, uh, he mentioned that every family has been touched, and every family has been touched, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, my mother had a number of miscarriages, my sister also, and Naomi in my office. So, so the, the issue of, of baby loss is one um, uh, that resonates with, uh, with us all. <coughs> in particular, excuse me, we've got a frog in my throat. I had a lady whom I greatly admired. Her name was Agnes Thomas. Agnes was, uh, um, she was dead and gone now, but she was four foot nothing. That's just uh, the size of her. She, was, she wasn't much of her. But she was definitely a whirlwind. And I remember uh, uh, her coming to see me. Um, she took care of her 105-year-old mother, and that's what the age of her mother was when she passed away as well. And very ill husband, daily with minimal help from anyone. When she passed away within a few months, her mother and husband died too. She was the centre of that home and the strongest, uh, one of the strongest women that I had ever known, apart from my own mother, of course, who at 93 is equally strong. However, underneath all that undeniable strength was also a lady that in her 80s came to the office to see if she could find out where her stillborn son Uh, thank you, honourable gentleman, for giving way. Uh, he's making a really, really powerful speech, and it's really good to hear the story of Agnes. And uh, I hope that he'll agree with me that sympathising with our constituents who've suffered such awful circumstances and telling their stories here is a good way to um, ensure that they're heard in the future. Thank you, honourable for that. Um, the, the story of her son is this. Her, her, her stillborn son was born sleeping in the early 70s and was buried. She came to see me over 50 years later. Thank you, the Honourable Member for Sankham for giving way. He's making a, a very passionate speech um, and I think everybody in this room can tell how, how, um, how impassioned the Honourable Member is. It's, it's a very touching story he tells. But does he agree with me that it doesn't matter how long ago this baby loss occurred, it will always stay with the family. I'm sorry about that, I shouldn't be. I know, I know it shouldn't. I thank the gentleman for, for giving me a chance to, to try and, uh, and, and recover some of my composure. She came to tears to ask where the Royal Victoria Hospital had buried her son. It meant something to her, even though it was 50 years later standing in my office, that wee small lady telling me her story, uh, which is breaking her heart 50 years later. And loss of a baby life is changing. And my thoughts are with those of whose families mentioned in the course of this debate, and there'll be others, and I know that others who are going to speak, and they will tell the same story uh, with the very same emotion, compassion, understanding, uh, and with that realness, that realness that the Honourable Gentleman for Ashfield compounded in such a fantastic way in his introduction. The fact that baby loss can be preventable makes the outcome that bit more difficult to accept. The phenomenal charity of Sands has given the following, following statistics this year. Stillbirth rate declined, and I give, Mr. Chairman, I always give an ordinary perspective to these debates simply because I feel it, it adds to the debate. But it also tells that the things that happen in Northern Ireland, or happen here, are no different for us back home. Yeah. The stillbirth, the stillbirth date, uh, rate declined 17.7 per cent in Northern Ireland between 2010 and 22. However, comparing the rate over a three-year average shows a small reduction of 10.1 per cent. My goodness, um, and although it's decreasing, it's still there. Uh, with, with a vengeance. The neonatal mortality rate has been higher in Northern Ireland than any other UK nation since 2013. So it does, uh, he, well, uh, they're equally bad wherever it is, but I'm just saying, making the point, Mr. Chairman, if I can, uh, that Northern Ireland has, ex uh, has examples of it which are above the, the rate anywhere else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you, Honourable Member, for giving way, and I thank you for the the most powerful uh, speech that he's making. Um, it's certainly a, a debate that I can resonate with on a very personal level as well. However, I want to make mention of a little boy called Teddy from my own constituency of Upper Ban, uh, who died and will it be forever seven weeks. He died from sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, would the Honourable Member agree with me that there needs to be better wraparound services, particularly within our hospitals, where there are 
schemes made available for families who find themselves in these most tragic circumstances, and particularly when they find them in the, th themselves in these circumstances, that there is the support and counselling and help right throughout their grief journey. And absolutely true. Um, um, uh, I, I tend to be emotional uh, at, the, at the best of times, Mr. Chairman. But whenever someone loses so, someone uh, at that time in particular, everyone resonates. Uh, and, and I think it's a time where, where people want to wrap your arms around them, like you, which you want to do, because that's the thing that we do. Uh, at the same time, uh, there has to be someone outside. I mean, the Honourable Gentleman gives some examples where, <coughs> with respect, people were just sent home. Uh, and and, and that's, that's so sad whenever they need someone. Uh, I, I, I feel, Mr Chairman, uh, that there should be a role, a greater role, and there is a role for, for churches and how they can, uh, and their ministers can help and, and give succour and support physically, emotionally, uh, mentally, uh, at, at a time uh, and with the best that you can. And those are things that we, we, we probably all try to do. Uh, I referred to the, the uh, unlike stillbirths and ne neonatal deaths, the total number of miscarriages and miscarriage rates are not reported in Northern Ireland, and this is something I feel we need to change. That's for us back home, not for the Minister here, because it's not our responsibility, because else it's a, a, a devolved matter. But I, I, do, I do feel that we, we, we need to do better. Uh, I still feel that the aims in the mainland should be replicated. Uh, and, and while I know the Minister is sitting in for the Minister who should be here, uh, is not able to be here, sorry, better way of putting it, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, may, maybe it could be conveyed to the Minister that we should be looking at a at an overall strategy for the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Although there is an ambition in England to have rates of stillbirth, of neonatal death, of preterm pre -term birth, maternal death and brain injury by 2025 relative to 2010, there is no equivalent ambition in Northern Ireland, but there really needs to be. So, so uh, that would be one of the things that I would love to see. Sam has stated that Northern Ireland uh, executive <coughs> must commit to reducing pregnancy loss and, de and baby deaths and eliminating inequalities. Any future targets must have a clear and agreed baseline to measure progress against. These targets should be the driving force. It's not just about having a goal. It's a goal that means something. Uh, and, and, and that's, I mean, we can have words with respect to the cows come home, but it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't turn into action. Uh, and, and that's what we need. So we need a clear and agreed baseline to measure progress against. These targets should be the driving force behind a programme of policy activity with funding and resources to meet them. So I agree with that. And I know that the need for funding and resources is the ambition of this debate today. Uh, as to highlight the issue, as to make people aware, as to give people an outlet uh, for, for those who have, uh, who have uh, painfully suffered uh, and who can and, and will carry that, uh, that, that, that burden with them all of their life. And that's what I too am advocating for, not simply for England, but throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. We have midwives who regularly find themselves staying after a handover as they are all understaffed. We find exhausted junior doctors being left with full maternity awards while their SOs catch up on the never-ending paperwork. And we have cleaning staff who are telling us that they don't have time to do all they need to do to clear the rooms of infections. All these are a matter of funding. And all of these are matters that are UK-wide in all parts of this great nation. These matters are matters of life and death. And the death of one little baby, just one, um, and we can all have those examples in our minds today. Uh, that did not need to happen as a tragedy. The number of babies that have died needlessly is not just a, a tragedy, it is a catastrophe, and we need to change that. So with that in mind, I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for, for giving us all an opportunity to participate in a small way in this debate, but with a united force. Politics aside, we're here as MPs on behalf of our constituents, and we will all say the same thing. The loss of a baby is devastating to a family. And if we can do something, then we must do it. Let's support the staff. And by doing so, we support the health of our mothers and their children. Thank you very much, Mr. Dale. And it's a pleasure to be serving under your chairmanship this morning. Um, and I want to start by thanking the Honourable Member for Ashfield for securing this very important debate today and for his very moving opening speech. Um, my thanks also go to Bliss for the briefing they provided. This is an incredibly important debate for me, for, for all of us here today, I have no doubt, because as some of you will know, I, um, like many, sadly many others here today, have experienced the devastation of baby loss. 
And I know not, I know not having not spoken about my experience of baby loss until 2016, which was 11 years after I became an MP, I know how difficult this can be to talk about openly. So I want to thank um, everyone, all colleagues here today for being here, some of whom I imagine um, have got personal motivations for, for being here, as we've already heard. So I want to just tell you a little bit about my daughter, Lucy, and about my experience of baby loss. My daughter, Lucy, was born at 23 and a half weeks, and she was sadly stillborn. And her heart beat throughout my labour just until minutes before she was born. And the experience of giving birth to a stillborn child is incredibly traumatic, as we've heard. And as I've previously spoken about, it feels weird that the world around you is not responding as they would if you had given birth to a live baby. And I felt, um, actually, that I made everyone around me feel um, very uncomfortable, or anyone I met feel very uncomfortable. And it is one of the last taboos, as the Honourable Member for Clapton spoke about um, in, in his uh, remarks also. So, no one knows what to say to you when you've um, lost a baby or given birth to a stillborn baby. It's everyone's worst nightmare. So, I didn't talk about it, and I certainly didn't tell anyone new to my life who hadn't known me before I lost Lucy. So, hence, when I became an MP in 2005, it took me until 2016 um, to actually talk about it um, in this place or to anyone from my post baby loss life, if you like. I've also previously spoken about the fact that compounding this grief was the fact that Lucy did not receive a birth or a death certificate. And even more upsettingly, that in my records, it was recorded as a stillbirth. It was, wasn't recorded as a stillbirth, it was recorded as a miscarriage because she was just days away from being 24 weeks, three, four days short of the required legal age to be eligible for a death certificate. And so because of that, she doesn't officially exist in any official records other than our own family records. So we did name Lucy during a blessing in a private room that I was moved to after she was born, having to give birth uh, amongst all um, in the maternity ward, amongst all the live babies. Um, she was then taken to the Chapel of Rest, and then we held a very small funeral service for her, organised by the chaplain at the hospital and the co-op, who funded everything, um, which I thought was just, you know, I'll be forever grateful for that, because it, it, it meant a lot at the time, and still does. The acknowledgement of Lucy's existence they provided us with was truly invaluable, particularly when this had been denied to us by the lack of a death or a birth certificate. So after my experience, I knew things had to change, even though I couldn't talk about it for a long time. So alongside former members, Will Quince, Antoinette Sandback, and Victoria Prentice, who some of us here will remember, Victoria just recently um, leaving the house at the last election, I then became a member, one of the founding members with those three of the Baby Loss APPG in 2016. And I'm pleased that this APBJ is still going. I hope it gets reformed and it's become a vehicle used to make great progress in regards to baby loss. In particular, with regard to securing um, bereavement suites across the country and improving patient pathways, better recording of data, and amongst many, many more improvements. Still more needed, sadly. I then became one of the only two MPs on the Pregnancy Loss Review alongside our former colleague Tim Lawton following his private members bill. And the review's work resulted in significant changes, not least the decision announced just earlier this year that parents who lose a baby before 24 weeks of pregnancy in England can now receive a, significant, a, a certificate in recognition of their loss. And I know that this has been a great source of comfort for many who now feel they can finally get the formal recognition and acknowledgement that their baby existed. And I'm certain it would have made a huge difference to me and my family. However, despite these, I will, happy to give way. The Honourable Member for giving way, and thank you for her very moving 
uh, a story that she, she has told, or real life story that you've told today. Uh, in relation to the baby loss certificates, I would commend her and her colleagues for their efforts. Would she agree with me that uh, a greater effort needs to be made, particularly in the devolved regions, and I'm thinking Northern Ireland, of replicating uh, what is happening here uh, in England with regards to baby loss certificates? Such is the importance of the issue for families. Absolutely, I would agree. And um, as we have devolved mat matters such as these, um, I only realised it was just for England um, when we were pulling together um, my remarks today. And I think that is remiss. It, it, I would encourage the, the, the other devolved um, region, nations to you know, follow the example of England and to bring that in, because it really does make a, um, a massive difference to um, parents suffering early baby loss. So however, despite these improvements, we still have a long way to go to pr provide the care and respect all families need during such a difficult time, as well as ensuring we take steps to reduce stillbirth rates. As expressed by Bliss, an organisation who campaigns for change for baby born, babies born premature or sick, um, there has been a concerning increase in the neonatal mortality rate and the preterm birth rate. They point to a high variation of care as a factor that can be addressed to reduce this worrying increase. And as the MP for Washington and Gates at South in the North East, I know just how damaging the impact of inequality can be as we experience the acute end of regional inequality which can manifest itself through less investment and less access to the resources we need. And in relation to baby loss, inequality prevails. And as Bliss highlights, babies lost to mothers from the most deprived areas has increased at a rate which is now twice that of babies lost to mothers living in the least deprived areas. And it would also be remiss of me at this point not to mention that neonatal <coughs> mortality rates are much higher when babies are from an ethnic minority with babies of black ethnicity being twice as likely to be stillborn compared with babies of white ethnicity. And it's a failure of our healthcare system that babies born of black and Asian ethnicity continue to have much higher rates of neonatal mortality. And this disparity is disgracefully seen in maternal healthcare too, as maternal mortality for black women is currently almost four times higher than that for white women. And tennis star, some of you may um, have heard Serena Williams has spoken in great detail about her awful experience in this regard. And I encourage you all to read her article in Elle um, magazine. It's available online still. And even as a globally very wealthy, recognized figure, Serena's voice during her uh, pregnancy and birth was dismissed. So we must ensure that there is the right training and support for healthcare professionals to ensure that all of these terrible disparities and this, you know, the, the cases we've heard today, um, so traumatic that they are addressed. Crucially, we must centre the voices of patients and listen to what, in this case, mothers usually, but sometimes, um, you know, the, the 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 partner who's there as well are saying about their own bodies and experiences. As we have seen with the high levels of disparity in neonatal healthcare outcomes, we will fail to achieve change if we are not listening to those at the heart of this crisis. And if we are to effect change, there must, then we must also increase our midwifery workforce, as well as increase the capacity in our NHS to allow for the necessary training to be delivered. I am pleased that Labour has taken strong action to get our NHS back on its feet and in our NHS manifesto we committed to training thousand more midwives as part of the NHS workforce plan and it's also significant that Labour have also said we will ensure that trusts failing on maternity care are robustly supported into rapid improvement and we'll set an explicit target to close the black and Asian maternal mortality gap also. I thank the Honourable Member for giving away. Uh, just when she's on the, the, the issue of greater resources being required, would she agree with me that two of the things I think that are emerging from this very, very important debate 
is the greater resources that are required to deal with the problem and also a greater understanding of the individualistic nature of the problem that no two mothers really will react and families will react in exactly the same way to baby loss that she is so very uh, passionately outlined as have other members and that those are the two of the very most important issues arising from this debate that hopefully we can learn from in the future. I absolutely agree with the Honourable Member. He makes um, a very valuable point that it, resources matter, but it's how they are implemented. And that human interaction um, is so, so important. And that's why um, the training of those professionals is so important. So in closing, Mr Dowd, I'm hopeful for the future and I'm proud of the change that has been made so far. I know looking at all the colleagues in the chamber t here today that together we are a powerful voice that can make such a difference to families during this terrible time and help improve outcomes for others so fewer experience this most dreadful loss in the future. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the honourable gentlemen for this important debate and thank you to the families for being here and sharing your experiences. Uh, I, I speak uh, as a father of a daughter, Mallory, who we lost at five days, and so I, I share your experiences. Um, we've heard today some, some stark statistics, and perhaps um, you know, what, what I will seek to summarise the national picture and some of the measures we might be able to take. Uh, we've heard of the numbers of losses, and we've heard that every loss is a personal tragedy. And we've also heard that every loss is not inevitable. Up to one in five stillbirths and neonatal deaths are preventable. In 2015, the then government announced an ambition to half the rates of stillbirth and neonatal deaths by 2025. But sadly, progress in delivering on this ambition has stalled. And without renewed action, we're going to fall well, well short. Uh, and digging a bit deeper, as, as my honourable friend highlighted, there are still further causes for concern. According to the 2022 perinatal mortality report, black babies are over twice as likely to be stillborn as white babies. Black and Asian babies are over 50% more likely to die shortly after birth compared with white babies. Research by baby loss charity SANS has explored the reasons for this inequality. And as a result, SANS are calling for specific actions to deliver positive, joined up, empathetic maternity and neonatal care through their End Inequality in Baby Loss campaign. And I would urge our new government to support these actions. Baby loss charities are also highlighting wider areas where improvements could help prevent baby loss. These include greater consistency in ensuring maternity services meet nationally agreed standards and guidelines. In effect, we know what needs to be done, but we need to implement it. In particular, the NHS Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle. Linked to this is the need for maternity units to be properly staffed, again, as we have heard so many times today. The Sands and Tommy's policy unit estimate that nearly a third of neonatal intensive care units, unit shifts are not being properly staffed. In addition, 63% of midwives are feeling unwell in the last 12 months due to stress. Overall, in 2022-23, nearly half of maternity services were rated as inadequate or requires improvement by the CQC. We know the NHS as a whole has been left broken by 14 years, years of neglect, and now we must look to our new government to ensure a safe maternity care system where national guidelines are consistently followed. But sadly, even with the best care and support, many families will still suffer the pain of baby loss. Effective bereavement support can be crucial in helping families come to terms with their loss. And again, I speak from personal experience in this regard. Despite wonderful work done uh, by charities, I'll mention the Friends of Serenity in, in, in my area of uh, Rosendale and Darwin and Burnley, um, and by NHS Trust, far too many bereaved parents cannot access the compassionate care that they need. This can usually impact, impact their well-being in the short term and for the rest of their lives. And this, of course, has related social and economic cost. As with so many aspects of primary care, effective early support reduces demand in the longer term. The issues and solutions are well understood. Healthcare professionals across the UK do not have sufficient access to bereavement care training. This means they are not adequately supported to gain the skills and confidence they need to provide excellent care for families when a baby dies, or indeed to look after their own well-being. The National Bereavement Care Pathway provides nine standards of care, 
across five different experiences of pregnancy and baby loss to ensure equality of bereavement care no matter where a parent lives in the UK. In England, all 128 NHS trusts have now signed up to the NBCP standards. I very much hope the new government will consider making this pathway mandatory and providing the funding to help trusts implement the standards. And I'll just finish off by, with a reminder that we have Baby Loss Awareness Week coming up in October, which culminates in the global wave of light on 15th of October. And I very much hope fellow members will be able to support the events in their constituencies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Dowden. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship today. And I'd like to thank the member for Ashfield for securing today's important debate. And my thoughts are with all the families whose experiences he shared today um, and with all those who've shared their own personal experiences in the room as well. Uh, this is an issue that is both deeply personal to, to me and uh, one that I've spoken uh, many times in the last five years um, about. Uh, and I'm sad to say I've not yet had my rainbow baby. Um, but, you know, it doesn't stop the questions every single month for probably the last year of asking if I'm pregnant, which I would encourage colleagues not to ask women um, because it is not only very rude, it can, it can uh, cause a lot of heart ache uh, for those who are struggling to conceive. Um, I've had the honour of working with dedicated campaigners, including Mylene Class, and we were privileged to welcome the former Minister uh, for Women's Health to Tommy's at the Women's Hospital in Birmingham. And it was great to get them there. And I'd like to extend that invitation to the new government's health team to see the research that has been done there, to see a, an alternative model of care which would see the end of the three miscarriage rule um, that has since been piloted um, in response to the review, but also to meet the families of those whose Tommies have helped to have their rainbow children. Um, and it was incredibly um, rewarding to hear their stories about how um, the small differences in care can really make that difference and allow people to have the families that they so desperately need whilst remembering the children that were, they were unable to, um, to hold um, in, in good health. Um, and, you know, it's been brilliant to work with Tommy and Sands for several years, pushing for meaningful and long overdue changes because it is estimated that 50% of people will be affected by baby loss during their lifetime, either personally or through someone they know. Miscarriage is common, but that doesn't make it any less heartbreaking. And often this leaves women facing grief in isolation, as well as men who have gone through this as well. We've been trying hard to break the taboo, increase support by employers, establish establish bereavement leave, better mental health support, because there is none in many cases, but most importantly, improving that pathway of care, for pushing for more early intervention for women who may be at higher risk, such as myself, who had undiagnosed diabetes, um, and also funding for research to make sure that we're doing all that we can to improve the life chances of people who are going through pregnancy. In the UK, 13 babies tragically die before, during, or shortly after birth every single day. National reports indicate that up to one in five of these stillbirths on, and neonatal deaths could be prevented if guidelines were simply consistently followed. That's simply not good enough, and these deaths are not mere statistics, but heartbreaking losses that call for our immediate attention and action. And I'd like to highlight the progress being made in addressing the challenges in miscarriage in response to the independent pregnancy review, because I think it's important that we, we show that there is more that can be done here. Um, we've touched on the three miscarriage rule, but that's really important that we make sure that the ending that is rolled out successfully. We've seen the pilot that we are waiting for the results of, but I'm hoping that this government will take seriously that change of model of care, which is not only um, backed up by research, that three number was picked out of mid-air by all accounts. There is no reason why someone should have to wait to have three miscarriages before they get basic tests for diabetes um, or for other reasons to understand why they may have miscarried. 
It is cruel. You wouldn't expect anyone to have three heart attacks before you did a basic test. Um, you know, it is laying bare the, um, the kind of sexism, I suppose, in our medical system that we would, uh, we would want to allow people to go through that so many times with so much loss and so much trauma before we would give them the answers that they need to perhaps go on to have successful pregnancies. The re review also provided 73 recommendations across various areas, including the graded model of care, which would be the alternative to the three miscarriage rule, um, supplying people with the support that they need from one <coughs> miscarriage, which is currently being trialled, um, as I say, at Birmingham. Um, another vital recommendation is 24-7 access to miscarriage care. At the moment, depending where you live in the country, you may have access to a early pregnancy unit. You may not. You may not have any access um, to information if you are suffering a miscarriage or what to do in that situation, leading to people turning up at A&E or staying at home and losing a child unnecessarily. Um, this is a critical measure to ensure that no one has to navigate the painful experience alone and is something that I would love to work with the government further on on how we can develop this in an affordable but successful way to reach all communities, whether they're rural or in a city. Um, however, there is one important area that I feel has been left out a bit from the conversation and it's been touched on today um, and it's, it's about data collection. Uh, now, it's, in, it's vital that we understand the issue, and there has been a push for systemic recording for all miscarriages to understand the true scale, because the numbers that we quote today are unknowns, really, because we haven't been doing this systematically. And it, I experienced uh, being called for my flu jab, um, and when I, I was a bit bemused by this, um, and asked why I'd been called for my flu jab, and they said, oh, it's because you're pregnant. And then they looked down and then realised I was not pregnant and said, oh, wait, you're not. Um, and that was a very difficult thing for me to go through. They did give me the flu job, which is quite, quite funny, I suppose. But, um, but it, was, um, it was really hard for me to go to that appointment and to hear that. And, um, and I know that a, a lot of my constituents have been asked if uh, it's their first child um, or how their other children are doing because the notes are just not there and the way that miscarriage and baby loss is flagged on their medical records is not sufficient um, to stop those kind of awkward and very upsetting experiences for women who have, who have been through baby loss. Um, and we want to get those national statistics because we truly want to understand the true picture and that will allow us to set targets and, and measure the impact of interventions that we, we so desperately need to introduce. Um, and while the previous government's commitment to 20 short-term actions, including um, some of the issues that I've kind of highlighted, is a positive step, it is deeply concerning that families are still having to face, um, you know, the trauma of multiple miscarriages before receiving uh, those investigative tests but also the mental health support. And that is something that I think is n not fully understood as well. And you're more likely to suffer from PTSD, depression, suicide. These are all very material issues for families who have experienced one miscarriage, never mind uh, the trauma of three. Um, so I hope that the government can look into this issue in more in more detail. Um, we've kind of heard about the issues of inequalities, um, but black babies are mo more than twice as likely to be stillborn, and black and Asian babies are over 50% more likely to die shortly after birth compared to white babies. And we have high rates of child um, fatality and high rates of miscarriage also reported in the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities. <laughs> and this disparity is unacceptable and I urge the government to renew and extend the national maternity safety ambitions setting clear targets to reduce these inequalities and I know I've, I've welcomed the reviews of these two areas um, when they were brought by the last government but I hope that we can learn the lesson soon and get action for those mothers. Every baby deserves an equal chance of survival it shouldn't matter what your background um, and we must also focus on um, improving prenatal care and this is an area that again is not given enough information on and I think you know early and regular antenatal care is critical but if we can provide advice guidance and support for women who have disabilities and, and illnesses um, we can help them uh, have safer pregnancies 
Um, but we still know, and we've heard today, that the, the basic care still isn't there for many people, um, and that is a gap that is essential for us to, uh, to focus on. We need to ensure that every expectant mother has access to timely, high-quality care, regardless of their background, as I've said, and alongside this, addressing health inequalities is absolutely crucial. Babies born into poverty are sadly more likely to die by their first birthday compared to those born into wealthier families and this disparity is a stark reminder of the broader social determinants of health that contribute to infant mortality. We must tackle these inequalities head on by improving access to healthcare, education and support for all families, particularly those from disadvantaged communities. Preventable baby deaths is a tragedy that we have the power to address and prevent. While we've made important strides, more work is desperately needed. I urge this government to commit wholeheartedly to giving every baby the chance to thrive and ensuring every family receives the essential support that they need throughout pregnancy and, unfortunately, throughout baby loss. Move to uh, Helen Morgan, Liberal Democrat spokesperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dad. It's a pleasure to serve with you in the chair. And I want to start by thanking the member for Ashfield for bringing this debate this morning. It's a really, really important debate, and sadly one that we have visited a number of times, even in the short period since I was elected in 2021. Um, the speeches today by other members have been excellent, and uh, I'll just touch on those briefly. Um, Thank you to the member for Ashfield for telling the stories of his constituents who've come along today and thank you to them for sharing their stories. They're very moving and it's tragic that they've been through those experiences. The member for Clacton uh, addressed the importance of the fact that the subject is taboo and that we need to get over that if we're going to support families properly going forward. Um, the <coughs> member for Morecambe and Loonsdale, who are welcome uh, to, the, to this place, um, stress the importance of providing support for bereaved families and the groups in her constituency that, to do that. And the member for Strangford told us a very moving story about um, his constituent Agnes, who, who felt that loss for the rest of her life. The member for Washington and Gateshead South has been a pioneering campaigner on this issue and uh, a successful campaigner, uh, particularly around the issue of the birth and death certificate for a lost baby. And uh, I'm sure everybody is very grateful to her for that. The importance of making memories for bereaved families is so important. Uh, the member for Rossendale and Darwin um, pointed out some of the really important statistics that we need to be considering as well today um, and the importance of effective bereavement support. And the member for Sheffield Hallam, who has also been an effective and tireless campaigner on the issue of miscarriage, ha and made an excellent speech. Um, I became the co-chair of the APPG for baby loss uh, shortly after I was elected because of the scandal at Shrewsbury and Salford Hospital Trust and the Ockenden report that was issued shortly afterwards. And there have been similar incidents at Morecambe Bay, um, East Kent, and we suspect there is a similar issue emerging at, at Nottingham uh, with the review currently underway by Don, Donna Ockenden. And it seems to me that the fact that these scandals have emerged across the country means that there are endemic failings that we need to address rather actually than blaming individual trusts. Uh, now, the reports that have come out on uh, Morecambe Bay and East Kent were by Dr. Bill Kirk Kirkup. The Ockham report was for Shrewsbury and Telford. And they raised very, very <laughs> similar issues, albeit with, in quite a different style. The first issue they raised was safe staffing and the importance of safe staffing in ensuring that babies don't die unnecessarily on maternity wards. Um, Sands and Thomas have uh, also led a campaign on that. The APPG supported that campaign. And the government, uh, the former government, did respond quite well in trying to improve midwife numbers in particular and ensure that uh, maternity units are safe places to be. Shrewsbury and Salford Hospital Trust has, has achieved its targets on safe staffing. Um, and that's one area that we need to keep the focus on because obviously safe staffing needs to be maintained going forward. It's not a one-off uh, act that you can do and, and hope for the best for the future. But the other issues that came up, learning from mistakes, listening to mothers and their families, and doing a proper review in the circumstances where something goes wrong, as inevitably, occasionally it will, to make sure that those lessons are learned is something that it feels like hasn't happened across uh, the NHS as a whole. We've seen in every review lack of openness and transparency with the families 
blame passed on to the mothers who've lost their babies. Uh, we've seen uh, a toxic environment within some of the hospital trusts uh, a, and a willingness to cover up what's gone wrong rather than be candid and learn from those mistakes. And it's really important that those issues that have been highlighted time and again, three separate reports, and we're expecting a fourth, actually don't just sit and gather dust on the shelf somewhere, but their actions are taken to ensure that those mistakes don't keep happening. Now, uh, honourable members have also raised this obsession with natural birth. I think it was the member for Morecambe and Leansdale. And I feel that very strongly as somebody who was asked by a midwife after having her own emergency C-section, uh, whether I felt like a failure for having been through that uh, emergency medical procedure. Well, the answer was no, not until you suggested that maybe I ought to. And then the shame and the guilt and the, uh, frankly, depression that followed that, you can probably imagine. We must get away from this obsession with natural childbirth. It is great for mothers with low-risk pregnancies and the best option for them, but it is not great for anybody who has a medical issue, and we mustn't uh, let an ideology lead the evidence and the science. So... I just uh, conscious of time, so I don't want to spend too long on it, but I, I really want to highlight that Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust has made great inroads on uh, implementing the immediate and essential actions that Donna Rockenden recommended. Um, but I would really welcome an update from the Minister on how those <coughs> national uh, actions have, have made progress. Um, and I'd also just like to point out that the, the disparity for ethnic minority women, whether they're black or Asian or from another ethnic minority, if that was happening in, a, in an individual trust, we would be up in arms. We would get, be getting in a professional to investigate what was going wrong there. So we mustn't lose sight of this disparity, this inequality, and make sure that we are dealing with those uh, uh, terrible outcomes for some of those women as well as the uh, wider situation in the NHS. One issue in particular is the importance of independent whistleblowing. In my own hospital trust, Shrewsbury and Telford, uh, the, say, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians report <coughs> onto hospital management, and people frequently report that they don't feel safe with whistleblowing. So can I urge the government to look at safe whistleblowing for looking at an independent office of the whistleblower to ensure that when people do raise medical concerns about safety, that they're being listened to and not closed down and not in fear of losing their jobs. Um, and finally... Uh, as I've pointed out, the scandals don't apply to a single hospital trust. There is a huge uh, variety in the, in the quality of care across the country. So can I urge the government to look at maternity care across the whole country and ensure that getting safe care isn't a postcode lottery. It's, it's consistent and fair to all women. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve under chairmanship. I'd like to begin by congratulating the Honourable Member for Ashfield on securing this important debate and also for reading the um, very emotive stories that he did this today. Um, many people witnessing birth for the first time describe the experience as a miracle of birth and it indeed is indeed the most wondrous occasion. I've been honoured to be present at the birth of over 100 babies, many hundreds of babies, in my work as an NHS doctor. Unfortunately, birth is an unpredictable process. And um, the Honourable Lady is right that we should not be focusing on natural birth, but on the outcome of a healthy mother and a healthy child. It doesn't always go smoothly. Generally, and indeed increasingly as I became a more senior doctor, I only attended the very high-risk deliveries, those where things go wrong. In a job focused on saving lives, the opportunity to do so at birth is perhaps the most rewarding. But sadly, despite the very best efforts of the whole team, midwives, obstetricians, paediatricians and allied professionals, some babies sadly die, and this leaves a hole in the families which, as others have said, does not go away. I spoke in the baby loss debate of 2022 as a responsible minister, and I'm reminded today of the words of Hayley Storrs that were read at that time by the Honourable Member for Leeds East. I'll read them now. What people fail to understand when someone loses a child is that you have lost a lifetime. First days at school, first steps, graduations, what their favourite story would have been, birthdays, Christmases. It's a very moving account which has stuck with me and really reminds us that this is a pain that endures and one we must do all we can to prevent. I pay tribute to my NHS colleagues who strive every single day to ensure pregnancy and birth lead to the happy, healthy outcome that we all want to see. But as politicians, we must do all we can to support this and the government, and we must hold the NHS to account when it fails to uphold the very highest of standards. 
I'd also like to pay tribute to the many, many great charities such as Sands, Tommies and Bliss, mentioned by others today, that do such great work in this area. I was proud to run the London Marathon with a constituent earlier this day, this, this year, to, to raise money for Bliss. And I'm grateful to the support that they provided to him. What we must do is focus relentlessly, um, and as the Honourable Member for Sheffield Hallam has said, starting preconceptually on every single factor, systematically, that can cause or increase the risk of uh, baby death. Um, these include reducing of teenage pregnancy, smoking, obesity, chronic illness optimization, ensuring that we know that if someone has diabetes, that if they have diabetes, it's optimally managed before they conceive. Medication changes if needed, making sure that someone is not taking teratogenic drugs at the onset of pregnancy, and making sure that um, folic acid is taken, making sure women are, are aware that folic acid should be taken before pregnancy and during the early parts of pregnancy. And I know that before the uh, general election, the government had consulted on um, for the fortification of flour with folic, uh, with folic acid to reduce the number of babies um, who suffer from the shortage of folic acid during their pregnancy. Can the Minister confirm whether this government will go ahead with that proposed legislation uh, to fortify bread products? Also, the um, Chancellor said that she was going to stop all non-essential communications. Many of these messages are public health messaging that need public communication strategies. Can the Minister confirm that this is an essential form of communication and is not restricted by the Chancellor's um, uh, restrictions on communication costs? Um, the NHS England introduced the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle. That focus is currently on six areas. Smoking, the assessment of fetal growth during pregnancy, the, asset, the awareness in, in parents and families that a reduction in fetal movements can be a significant warning sign, the expertise training for the monitoring of CTGs, the way of monitoring during labour and pregnancy, the reduction of premature birth, and the management of diabetes to make sure that people have optimal diabetes control. The NHS had a plan to update this to introduce maternal early, early warning schools and tracking tools. Can the Minister confirm if the NHS is on track to deliver this? Can the Minister also confirm that um, the Saving Babies, Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle will be updated this year and indeed updated at regular intervals as evidence improves on how we can best reduce the number of baby deaths? Two years ago, as Minister, I delivered a statement to the House on behalf of the Government regarding the outcome of Bill Kirkup's independent review of maternity services in East Kent. A very sobering report. The tragic events had revealed failings, and failings seen previously elsewhere. Failings which should not and must not be repeated. In response to this review, the Government set up a group chaired by Maria Caulfield, the then Minister, to oversee the work being done to improve maternity services nationwide, including the recommendations of Dr Kirkup's um, report. So can the Minister confirm that the work of this group is going to continue under the new government? And can she confirm, if so, who will be leading it? Can she confirm that she'll support the work of the Healthcare, healthcare Safety Investigations Branch, which um, investigate all cases of stillbirth and life-changing injury, to see what lessons can be learned and how they can be improved? Um, others have talked about the Sands and Tommy Saving Life Report and, in particular, workforce issues. The previous government has, as was said, invested heavily in increasing workforce numbers, building five new medical schools, which takes time but will ultimately increase the number of obstetricians and paediatricians of the future. The number of midwives also increased. There are 23,361 full-time equivalent midwives in the NHS Trust and other core organisations in 2023, which is an increase of 19% since 2010. Births fell over England, where England and Wales over a similar period. Now, in the budget in the spring, the government, then government committed £35 million to improving um, babies' care, £9 million of which was um, related to um, uh, brain injury and how to prevent brain injury. And the remainder mostly related to a, a funding of 160 additional um, posts in midwifery and neonatal care. So can the Minister confirm that that uh, investment will still proceed to help support the lives and the care of um, pregnant women and babies? Um, in summary, it's, it's, it's almost 10 years since the government launched maternity safety ambition. And while that goal has not yet been achieved, 2020 to 2022, the stillbirth rate fell by a fifth. 
the rates of maternal mortality fell by a fifth, and the rates of neonatal mortality for those babies born after 24 weeks fell by 36%. These statistics are a good achievement, representing as they do many hundreds of families who will now enjoy watching and with love as their children grow, thrive and develop. We must build on this now to ensure that many more families, indeed all families, have the same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and indeed um, be here for the government in this um, really important and very moving debate. And I am grateful to the Honourable Member for Ashfield for raising this important uh, issue. Um, as the member for Washington Gateshead South said that the last taboo and the member from Clapton, I think, articulated well the difficulties um, of many people knowing what to say. Um, it gives me the opportunity to put on record my deeper sympathies to these bereaved families. Thank you for making the decision to come here today. I know there'll be other people uh, perhaps listening in on the Parliament challenge. It's a brave decision, um, and I commend the member for giving voice to the stories, the very moving stories, very harrowing stories, um, of Emma and Rob, of Bianca Chapman, of Amelia Bradley and Hayley Moore about their babies, Olivia, Emisa and Theo. We know this remains a serious issue and every time such debates become before the House and we've heard today many people have taken part in those debates previously, I do think, and I've listened in before, what little consolation they must be for parents that have lost a loved one. Um, and, and those wider families. And I am always inspired, and I hope the families here today um, recognise that, of course, that every member of Parliament is also a human being with their own experience and their family's experience. And um, as many have said, it is something that touches every family. As a member for Strangford said, it's something that stays with families for decades. And sharing those experiences today is very brave of honourable members, and I think that gives voice to how important this is. Because every baby's death is tragic, and it's all the more devastating when parents are told that it could have been prevented. As we've heard, report after report has told us this remains a serious issue in our health service, and that's backed up by the data. Two years ago, the ONS found there were almost 2,300 stillbirths recorded in England and almost 1,700 neonatal deaths, a rate of 2.9 per 1,000 live births. Now, I welcomed the Ockenden Review, as many others did, in 2022, but it did make for really harrowing reading. And this government's position is that any preventable death is unacceptable and we are committed to making sure all baby deaths can be prevented, will be prevented. Donna Rockenden's review shone a light on maternity staff too exhausted to do their jobs. It showed patterns of poor care, a lack of adequate training for staff, failure in governance and leadership that led to widespread avoidable harm and death and shocking inequalities in maternity provision. Dr Bill Kirkett's review in East Kent identified some similar themes but also showed that leadership and culture changes are needed. That's why this government stood on a manifesto to train thousands more midwives and to set up an explicit target to close the black and Asian maternity mortality gap. Now there are a number of initiatives and some of which we've heard on today and I will run through some of those and I'm happy if I don't address concerns from honourable members about the update including um, the, the, the opposition and I, I commend the uh, Honourable Lady for her experience in this area as a clinician as well as a spokesperson um, we will get back in touch with people but the, the NHS put in place a three year plan to deliver the recommendations to make maternity and neonatal care safer more tailored to every new mother's needs and more equitable that includes the Saving Babies Lives Care Bundle that is being rolled out to every trust. That provides maternity units with guidance and interventions to reduce stillbirths, neonatal brain injury, neonatal death and preterm birth. That, of course, will need to be regularly updated, but I will confirm the details to the Honourable Lady. It also includes initiatives to reduce inequalities. A serious cause for concern is the higher rate of stillbirths. Neonatal deaths and preterm births amongst babies from the black and Asian ethnic groups, as we have heard. Babies of black ethnicity are around twice as likely to be stillborn than babies of white ethnicity. And that's unacceptable in modern Britain. We will not rest until the outcomes are equally good for everyone in this country. We also know that women living in deprived areas, not least in my own constituency, are likely, more likely to suffer adverse outcomes. In 2022, the stillbirth rate per 1,000 births in the 10% 
deprived, most deprived areas was 5.0, that's 389 in England. In the 10% least deprived areas, the stillbirth rate was 3.7%, 105 in England, 155, apologies, in England. All local maternity and neonatal systems have equity and equality action plans in place to tackle these inequalities, and NHS England are investing £10 million every year to target the 10% most deprived areas of England. There is wider work which is also important. NHS Resolution's Maternity Incentive Scheme is improving maternity safety by rewarding NHS trusts that demonstrate they are taking concrete steps to improve the quality of care for women, families and newborns. The National Institute for Health and Care Research has commissioned studies into how we can prevent preterm births and improve care for mothers and babies. And this year, they launched a £50 million funding call challenging researchers and policymakers to come up with new ways of tackling maternity inequalities and poor pregnancy outcomes. Finally, there are ongoing initiatives to ensure lessons are learned from every individual tragic event and to prevent similar events happening in the future. All hospitals are already carrying out internal perinatal mortality reviews, which create reports that aim to provide answers for bereaved parents about why their baby died. They also help hospitals to improve care and ensure they try and learn something from every tragedy, wherever it happens. The Maternity and Newborn Safety Investigations Programme includes independent investigations of early neonatal deaths, <coughs> intrapartum stillbirths and severe brain injury in babies following labour. Now, all trusts are required to tell the programme about these incidents, who will then carry out an independent investigation and make safety recommendations to improve maternity services. And coroners are also required to investigate deaths that are violent, unnatural or of unknown cause through their remit, though their remit excludes stillbirth, but that should leave no stone unturned to uncover the cause of death, including an inquest where appropriate. Additionally, as of June 2024, um, all NHS have, trusts, I'm, I'm assured, have signed up to the National Bereavement Care Pathway, which many honourable members have raised here today. Um, now, those existing measures taken together, and we have heard about some of the positives here today, they are helping to achieve improvements, because since 2010, the neonatal mortality rate has decreased by 25% for babies with at least 24 weeks completed gestation, and the stillbirth rate in England has decreased by 23% with the overall rate of brain injuries occurring during soon after birth, which has fallen by 2%. But we, of course, know, and we've heard so movingly here today, that more must be done. And people rightly expect assurances that lessons will be learnt and that things that went wrong are not repeated. But the sad truth is, and again, we've had this alluded to today by honourable members, that we are likely to be debating these issues in the future when the CQC will release their next report on maternity inspections, when Donna Ockerden completes her investigations in Nottingham. And I do expect to be meet, talking with honourable members again, and my, uh, my, 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 my friend, the, uh, the, the Baroness, the Minister for Patients, Safety, Women's Health and um, uh, Mental Health, will obviously be um, following that very closely. Because many of the issues identified locally are being repeated across the country. So I'm clear that national leadership is needed. This government will be honest about the challenges facing the health service and we are serious about tackling them. I will listen to women and their families and do everything I can as Minister to help deliver safer and fairer maternity and neonatal services for women and their babies. And I really do commend uh, the honourable members uh, who have shared their experiences today. Can I say particularly for new members? Um, I don't think that's something as a new member of parliament that I would have been able to do. Uh, my honourable friend from uh, um, Washington Gates had South said very on honestly about how long it took her to do. Uh, but it is valuable. Um, I think um, it's not for me to say, but I do commend the work of really in terms of being the government minister. But what the honourable lady and other colleagues across party, and I think I hope that's assuring to families that are here today across party have done with the APPG on baby loss and have raised these issues and worked with government ministers is really important as parliamentarians and I, I do hope that that work is continued by parliamentarians across the house and maybe that's an outcome of today's result about raising this so early in this parliament. But we do need to listen uh, to those women and their babies and we do need to make sure that we've got the midwifery and other staff needed to keep women and their babies safe. 
Before I end, I just I think if I've missed anything, please, I'm sure honourable members will be in touch. And can I just say um, to the honourable lady from Sheffield Hallam, we do welcome the Tommy's miscarriage pilot, and my ministerial colleague will be looking very closely at those recommendations. Um, as a new government, we want to um, end the sticking plaster politics, which means real and lasting change in the health service, and that will take time. But we will build a better future for women in this country, and that includes by making sure all baby deaths that can be prevented will be prevented. Thank you, Mr Dowd. Thank you. Anderson to wind up. Thank you, Mr Dowd. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming to this debate today. It has certainly been an education for me. And, you know, the amount of members that have turned up for a Westminster Hall debate and are all touched by, by baby loss is, is, is incredible. I have actually been educated as well today on, on C-sections because when I went to the, my local hospital to talk about births and the amount of C-sections that were happening as opposed to, to natural births, I asked the question, you know, why are people having all these C-sections? Why don't you just and I apologise for this, make them have a natural birth. But actually, during this debate today, I understand that. I understand why, you know, there are different outcomes for different people, and, and sometimes the C-section is more, more appropriate for, for a woman. Uh, and I know that creates problems as well with the scarring, and, and it's a wound, and, and that sort of stuff. But, but thank you for educating me on that. And one of the most moving stories today was from the member for Strangford, my good friend, there about... This, this never leaves a family. You know, it could be 50 years on. And these parents and, and family members will probably celebrate birthdays. First birthday, second birthday, fifth, tenth, going to school, 18th, 21st, and go through all that because they will be around other children, other young people that would have been born at the same time. And they would be thinking... That could be my child in that class, that could be my child in that football team, that could be my child playing in that netball team, that could be not my child going on that, on that prom in that Cadillac. So I thank the Honourable Member for Strangford for that. He always speaks with, with great passion. Well, I thank all members, really, today for all speaking with great passion and great dignity. It's been, it's been wonderful, a wonderful debate. Very sad, but uh, a wonderful debate, nevertheless. And I thank the ministerial team and the shadow minister but most of all, I want to thank these people in the public gallery who have turned up. They've been extremely <coughs> brave. Uh, the families from Ashfield, the councillor, the lady from Sands. This has been incredible. So thank you, Mr Dow. Thank you. Uh, the question is that this House has considered preventable baby deaths. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, order, order. Members who are not staying to leave the room, please. Thank you.